All right, good evening. This is The Secret, How to Fight Child Protective Services and When. And this evening I'm joined by two guests, uh, Etern attorney Elizabeth Jacobo and therapist Brian Hamilton. Good evening, you guys. Good evening, Vince. Great to be here. You know what? I'm going to ask both of you to introduce yourself uh, to the audience. So let's start with you, Elizabeth. Tell us about yourself. Um, sure. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Jacobo, and I've been a dependency attorney for approximately 13 years. Um, originally, I worked as a, a court-appointed attorney, and uh, now I have the privilege of working um, privately with you, Vince, and uh, it, it's it's a great gig. Well, great. How long have you been practicing dependency? 13 years. Okay. Um, Brian? My name is Brian Hamilton. I'm a therapist associate at Life Source Affordable Counseling. Um, I've been uh, working there for about uh, two years now. And do you have any CPS cases that you work on? Um, sure. As a therapist, um, I'm obviously a mandated reporter, so I work with um, clients who have been victims of domestic violence. I've worked with kids who have been um, victims of child abuse and, um, you know, have to make those calls. So. Okay. Have you ever testified in court? I have not, no. Written reports for the court? Uh, yes, I have. Elizabeth. Yeah. And Brian. For this evening, we can't mention any names on any cases that we're, you know, involved with or have been involved with. Sure. So I want you guys to keep that in mind when we're talking. Elizabeth, tell me about, uh, you know, some interesting cases that you're dealing with currently. <clears throat> well, I do have some interesting cases. Um, the opening line um, talks about can some just random anonymous caller call in or your ex-husband or ex-spouse. And, you know, currently I do have... A couple of cases like that that really um, are tough. You know, the child was in the care of uh, one parent for a whole long time, and the other parent was more of a deadbeat dad. And um, there was a incident that occurred. Um, so they involved the other father, and um, it just it, it turned into a mess. And now the department is allowing this person to pretty much blackmail my client about when they get to see the child because their parent is the caretaker. So in other words, they need to cooperate with them or else, you know, they may have some issues with um, seeing their kid. And it's unfortunate that um, some of the main problems we have with dependency cases is who actually gets to take care of your child when all this is going on. And that can turn into a whole bunch of mess. Um, I do have a case that I find really interesting. We have not even, in other words, the department hasn't even taken, um, the court, I'm sorry, hasn't taken jurisdiction of the case yet. So it's in the early stages, pre-adjudication, you would call it. And um, there's been a lot of problems with um, getting the children um, to the care of the department because they were released to a, a relative. And, and now, um, it's pretty difficult uh, for the department to try and get these children back when they're out of state. So that's going to be interesting. We'll see how that one turns out. Um, they want to issue arrest warrants on, on parents that don't have the children. I mean, literally, the court is aware that the children are out of state, but yet they still were inclined to issue uh, arrest warrants. And thankfully, we objected properly in that case, and we were able to stop that. And... Uh, so we have a, an, another appearance next week where they're going to try and find a way to get around the disentitlement uh, doctrine and try and apply that as to why they should be able to still um, issue a criminal order on our client, even though they're well aware that they don't have the child. So, What is the disentitlement doctrine about? I think it basically means that 
even though you um, don't have these children in your care, you have gotten in the way and you've been in contempt of, um, you know, you've been in contempt of court orders. And so you're not able to, um, they, they want to use that as a means to say that you have the child and you know that you have the ability to give the child back. So until then, we're going to put you in jail. But it turns out that um, the minor's attorney called in because it doesn't look like there's any cases where that applies right now, um, Vince. It looks like everything is post-jurisdiction and this is a pre-jurisdiction case. So um, we've got the law on our side on this one. Very good. I remember talking to you about this. Yeah. The children were placed with a relative outside the state of California. Mm -hmm. They issued a, a, a restraining order against that caretaker, though, that is outside of the state of California, which basically doesn't have any weight outside of the state of California. So, Interesting. Yeah. Have they gone there and tried to... Uh, did oh. arrest that caretaker? Yeah. Well, what happened was um, they went down there with the police from the state when they asked them if they would, you know, go along with them because the department from Los Angeles flew out to that state and they took two workers out there. They went to the uh, CPS office in that state, asked for assistance in going out to the home and trying to uh, get the children. But the problem was... Um, that state really didn't want to be too cooperative because, I mean, they went along, but they had already gone and done wellness checks on these children and they found them to be safe and fine and they don't want to get involved. They don't believe that these children are being neglected or abused. So they show up at the house, they knock on the door, um, and the police are asking about the children. Basically, they tell them, well, I'm sorry, they're not here. Um, are you going to tell us where they're at? Nope, they're fine. They're at a religious, you know, camp. And that was kind of all they could do. They left. They came back another two days later. Um, this time, the person was a little annoyed. They're like, are you going to arrest me? Do you have the ability to arrest me right now? And they're like, well, no, we don't. And so then she's like, well, get off my property then. And so that's where we are in that scenario. That's interesting. Why did they want to take them? If that state had checked on the kids and said they're fine, why does California want to go and take the kids away from them? Well, because that's what the department does when they don't get their way. These children were already looked at and they were placed with this relative that happened to have been out of state. It was over the department's objection, but the court did it. And they had looked in, they, the kids got appointed an attorney. They spoke with them. Everything seemed to be fine. And then it seemed that... Um, one of the relatives of one of the fathers of the children got angry and uh, called the department and basically lied and said that the mother was lying to the department and the children were not really outside of the state. And they were actually coming back and forth with the mother. And in other words, they were making a fool of the department. So the department didn't like that. And based on that, pretty much, they um, changed the order and asked for the kids to be returned to the state of California. There was a report that was submitted. There was some alleged pictures attached. I argued that these pictures can come from, you can screenshot anything off Instagram with a new date on it. You know, we and, and that's basically um, what they did. There is no picture of my client in the car, but yet with that, that was enough for them to now issue this order and turn everything around and um, want to bring the kids back before we even go forward on the case. Is, does the relative live in that foreign state or is the relative here in California? That relative lives in outside the state. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, keep me posted on that because uh, you and I talked about that case before. Um, all right. And the problem is it's in Lancaster and is notorious. Lancaster um, is notorious for taking a very long time to adjudicate cases, to dispose of cases, to move on with cases, and then it just disadvantages parents because then they run into timelines. All right. My engineer is telling me we have to take our first break. If you have any questions or want to share your story with us, uh, please give us a call. It's 800-222-5222. We'll be back right after these messages. <laughs> 